Thank you, BC Singers. That was wonderful. I love that you not only sang, have I done, have, uh, choose the right, but have I done any good in the world today? My father-in-law used to say, be good, but it's, it's good to be good, but it's, you've got to be good for something. Go do some good. Not just be good to be good, be good to do good. It's a delight for me to be with you this morning. As I prepared this talk, I, was, I could feel something about how much the Lord loves you, that he knows you, and that he wants to speak to you today. And I felt him guiding me to see what I could do to help that happen. And uh, as I came and shook your hands and looked into your eyes, I felt that even more, that the Lord has great things for you to do. You all, you each, each one of you has an important mission for which you came to earth. I could feel your faith. I could feel the faith of your fathers and your mothers that has brought you here and caused you to come to this unique institution of higher learning, the LDS Business College. Each of you are here because of that faith. Unlike many other educational institutions, in addition to helping you obtain an education and a transferable degree, this one also focuses on deepening and strengthening your discipleship in Jesus Christ and is committed to creating an environment of deeper learning where you can not only receive information you need, but you can learn how to learn and develop the capacity to be a constant and continuous learner throughout every day of your life. What a blessing to be part of an institution with that focus. You have a team of exceptional leaders I have known and loved Alinda and Bruce Cush for many years. I know of the great love they have for you. Every time I talk to President Cush, he's talking about how wonderful you are. I know how committed he is to helping you succeed. He knows one thing that we all know, and that is that you are the future. You're the future of the church. You're the future of the world. And uh, we are committed to do everything in our power to help you have a bright and happy and fulfilling future. And to that end, I pray that the Spirit can be with us today, that we can learn the things that will help you to, to move towards that great future that the Lord has prepared for us. Good learning and good decisions are inseparably connected. You cannot make good decisions if you're not learning well. Good learning is essential to our growth and progress here on Earth. We are on the Earth today because of the growth and progression that we experienced in our pre-mortal life. Our progress there came because of the things we learned from our heavenly parents and the decisions that we made there, the most important of which was to choose Heavenly Father's plan. His plan was to come to this earth. And now we've changed worlds. Because we made that choice and chose his plan, we've come to this world. We're here on earth with mortal bodies that our parents prepared for us. The immortal spirit that lived with him now is living in this body of flesh and bones. And that spirit that we each bring brings with it all of the knowledge and all of the experience that we gained in our pre-mortal life. It also brings the characteristic traits that we develop by living the truths that we learn there. The challenge and the adventure that we have here in mortality is to continue the process of learning, of growing and developing. There's a pattern that the Lord that that pre-earth experience teaches us. It's a pattern of continual growth and progression. It's said that God's course is one eternal round. So there's this pattern or a cycle. It involves the principles of agency, of knowledge, and of choice. 
Those are the foundations of the pattern. The pattern is this. God places us in a situation specifically prepared for us. There are no accidents. Each of us is placed here on earth in the, in the circumstances that are most important for us. And as we are baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and seek God's guidance, He will place us in those circumstances and help us to get to where He needs us. He permits us in that circumstance to exercise our agency, to seek knowledge and make decisions on how to act or not act on the truths that we learn. And as we act in obedience, we gain experience and make progress. The Lord explained this to the Prophet Joseph Smith, quote, That which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. In our pre-mortal life, we're, we're placed in a situation where we could learn from heavenly parents. We chose to act in obedience to those truths, and for that reason, we were given the opportunity to come to earth to grow. And so that was the first cycle of our, our growth was there. And now we're here, and we are each in a cycle here on earth. We were born to mortal parents. Initially, they nurtured us and made every decision for us. We didn't get to decide what we would eat, what time we went to bed, what time we got up, and what we wore. That was a necessary part of our growth until we could gradually, gradually obtain the knowledge and capacity that we needed to begin to make choices on our own. Over time, we've developed that ability to some degree or another to act as agents of our own lives. Now most of you have left home and have become responsible for every aspect of your daily lives. You remember that first day you left home and you said, what am I going to eat tonight? Who's going to fix it? Why aren't my clothes washed? We have to accept responsibility for all of those aspects of our lives. And we're going through that process of learning how to, how to seek knowledge, how to exercise judgment, and to use our agency to make the choices that will give us the growth and happiness that we want. As we learn how to effectively navigate the circumstances of each situation that we are in, then the Lord will stretch us. As soon as we kind of figure out that situation, He says, okay, I'll give you a new one. And so He gives you a new circumstance that will add new dimensions to our growth and experience. Those new circumstances come in many different ways. Sometimes they come in, the, in, a, in a calling. They can come in an educational opportunity, in establishing a family, getting married, and having children, or in the different jobs that we might have throughout our lives. But in each of those circumstances or situations, we will, are given a new opportunity to struggle and grow and learn the principles that pertain to that situation and apply them in our lives. So long as we continue acting as an agent, the Lord will help us to continue to grow. This pattern of continual learning and becoming will be repeated dozens of times in our lives. Indeed, the richness and fullness of our mortal experiences will be determined by how well we use each of those new circumstances we are placed in here to increase our knowledge of truth and to act to apply those in our lives. That's the pattern that the Savior understood perfectly when He came to earth and lived His mortal life. Quote, And I, John, saw that He, Christ, received not of the fullness at first, but he received grace for grace until he received a fullness. The Savior obtained a perfect knowledge of the truths applicable to every situation in which he was placed here on immortality. And in every instance, he acted consistently with the truths that he had learned. His will was perfectly aligned with truth and the will of his Father in every act 
of every day of his life. There was no step he took, there was no word he spoke, there was no act he performed that was not in harmony with the will of his Father. What a high standard. Do you think we could achieve that? Probably not, but we can try. Now, last week I was listening to Elder Uchtdorf in General Conference, and something he said struck me. It didn't have to do with hobbits. He said, remember that discipleship is not about doing things perfectly. Sometimes when we think of Christ and think of him doing things perfectly, we say, I could never do that. But he said, remember, discipleship is not about doing things perfectly. It's about doing things intentionally. It is your choices that show what you truly are, far from your abilities. Your choices that show what you truly are, far, from your, far more than your abilities. I was struck by that word intentionally. I thought about the Savior's life and how he was able to achieve living intentionally every day of his life and mortality, and how important that is to me and for you to follow that perfect example of living an intentional life. Intentionally means consciously, deliberately, or with purpose, on purpose. It means not leaving things to chance or coincidence. We live intentionally when we think deeply about why we do what we do and make conscious and deliberate efforts to incorporate our beliefs and values into every aspect of our daily lives. It involves making plans and establishing goals to reshape actions so that our actions shape our lives, not life shaping our actions. Living intentionally drives constant learning and growth in our lives as we try to align our will to God's to fulfill our individual mortal missions. Each one of us came to earth with an individual mortal mission and to find what that is and to focus on it and grow from grace to grace just as Jesus Christ did. Now, if we think about the opposite of intentional, that's unintentional or unwitting or aimless. Living unintentionally involves just going with the flow, letting life carry us where it will, responding to external influences instead of making conscientious personal decisions, and passively and thoughtlessly accepting and acting on the ideas of those around us. Unintentional living requires little to no effort on our part. It's a passive surrendering to the ideas, values, and forces around us, permitting them to act upon and shape and motivate us. The unintentional life feels no need to embrace values or to act to incorporate them into our daily living. It lets life shape us rather than shaping our life, than having us shape our life. Now, what are the challenges of living an intentional life? We have wonderful tools tools that generations before us have never had. We've got these wonderful things that we call smartphones. We've got computers. We've got all of these things that can help us live an intentional life, or they can take over our lives. I stopped wearing my smartwatch because it kept telling me what I should do. It would come on and say, breathe. I'm already breathing, thank you. I don't need you to tell me that. Get up and move. You don't know. I'm in a meeting. I can't get up and move right now. It got a little obnoxious. I said, I can figure this out, I think. You're not going to tell me how to live my life. <laughs> and so we have these great tools, but they're also these tools can take over our lives if we let them. Let me share an example. This is a quote. The trouble started when I signed up for Amazon Prime. I started out ordering a few books here and there, and it was incredibly convenient. It was amazing that I could order something and it would show up on my porch in two days. I didn't even have to go to the store. Eventually, what started out as an occasional convenience became a not-so-occasional habit. Individually, those small daily purchases didn't seem like much. With an effortless tap of the one-click purchase, money flowed out of my bank account and a little brown cardboard box was shipped and showed up on my door. 
Not even the monthly credit card statement set off any warnings. Whenever I had an opportunity to join my family or friends on a trip, I never seemed to be able to go. I love traveling and spending time with people I care about. It was what I always talked about wanting to do, and it puzzled me why I wasn't able to do it. One day, I needed to look for an item that I had purchased over a year earlier, and in doing so, started digging through my Amazon purchase history. At that moment, I decided to download four years of purchase records from the site. I'm not sure why it took him four years to figure this out. The result was shocking. Years of small daily actions added up to create a massive impact for me. For me, this was quite damaging to my bank account and the lifestyle that I dreamed of. Over the course of four years, I had spent thousands of dollars on purchases, most of which I didn't even remember making. Those small purchasers were the epitome of unintentional living. In this true story, a bright and capable individual seeded his intentional life for an unintentional life. It's hard not to do that in today's world. You remember President Stephen W. Owen's talk last week in conference? He talked about waking up one morning ready to study his scriptures and pull out his phone. But when he pulled it out, before he could get to his scriptures, he noticed he had some messages that came in overnight. And he sat down and started working on the messages. Two hours later, he realized he still hadn't studied his scriptures. Well, that's not an unusual experience. All of us could kind of feel a little bit guilty about that, couldn't we? Think about other experiences. How many of us have thought to take a short break from studying to play a quick round of Minecraft or Fortnite? You look up a few hours later and say, oh, that break was a little longer than I intended. <clears throat> and do I even need to ask how many of you have just said, I'll hop on my social media to take a quick look or make a short post and looked up a few hours later to say, oh, I better get back to my studies. Unfortunately, the very devices and tools that make our lives Convenient can make our lives convenient, and intentional can also make our lives unintentional. So, you're asking, Elder Piper, are you saying that I need to get rid of all my social media or video games? I'm saying you need to decide to use those and make those tools intentional. President Nelson has made some pretty specific invitations about social media. And he's made those for a reason. When a prophet of God makes an invitation, we should listen and think about that. You're free to choose. That's part of what this is all about. And part of being free to choose in this age is that. You are free to choose how you will use these things and whether you will choose to live an intentional life or an unintentional life. If you choose to live an unintentional life, you stop learning, you stop stretching, you stop growing, you stop deciding, and you stop being an agent. You become an object, and the world and life and social media and all of these tools act upon you. Two examples that I just want to share. One is kind of humorous, and the other one is a little bit sadder. The first, when I was younger, I worked with a wise and experienced attorney. One day we met a man who served in a public office. He'd served in that office for 20 plus years. I was impressed and I commented to my lawyer friend. I said, he must be, you know, smart and experienced having served for 20 years. He just smiled and said to me, he doesn't have 20 years experience. He has one year experience 20 times. He was teaching me that that public servant had lived unintentionally. He had lived the same thing over. It was Groundhog Day. Just lived it over 20 years. Didn't know any more after the 20 years than he knew after the first year. A second experience from my youth. During my teen years, I had a friend 
who was a member of the church that I grew up with. He had been raised in a home where the gospel was taught. He'd gone to the same class as I had. But he'd made a choice to be unintentional in his gospel commitment, to just go with the flow, to have fun. He told me once, I know the church is true. I just want to have some fun while I'm young. When I'm done, I'll get active again. The sad part is that conversation took place 40 years ago. He's still a teacher in the Aaronic Priesthood. He's never gone to study higher education, to get any education at all. He's never attended the temple. He's never had his family sealed to him. And so when we're unintentional, those are just two examples of how our progress stops. It stops temporally and it stops spiritually, both. If we want to progress, we have to live intentionally every day. Author Annie Dillard has said, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. Unquote. It follows that being intentional on how we spend our days will ensure that our lives are rich, full, happy. So you're saying, I'm convinced that I need to live more intentionally, Elder Piper. Now how do I do it? Well, you're going to have to figure that out. I'll give you a few thoughts. You'll have to make those decisions yourself. But the gospel gives us the perfect framework and values needed for intentional living. We've already accepted those values when we became disciples of Jesus Christ. And that commitment to work intentionally to learn his truths, to cultivate his virtues, to incorporate his attributes of his character into our own. For the next few minutes, let's think how we could apply that framework to our lives in practical ways. How do we make intentional living? How do we make every day intentional? Well, one of those ways is to find the thing that we need to do to make our next step in progress. So think about that. What is it that you're worried about in your own self? It could be a character issue. It could be something that you're not quite living a standard that you think you should be living. If you don't quite know what to do and, and, and how to respond to that, take time in your daily scripture study in the morning to study the topic. Ponder the principle. And then, after you've studied it and pondered it, write down what you learned. And then kneel down in your prayer and teach Heavenly Father, explain to him what you learned. This is what I've learned about this that I want to improve on. And tell him how you feel and what you want to do, what your desire is. And then just wait and see what he tells you to do that day to take a step to help improve what you were discussing with him. If you do that every day, you'll take the little steps that come. This is the process that President Nelson described last April. He said, when Jesus asks you and me to repent or to change, really repentance is the invitation to live intentionally. He's inviting us to change our mind, our knowledge, our spirit, even the way we breathe. And then he gave us some specific areas to consider. He's asking us to change the way we love, think, serve, spend our time, treat our wives, teach our children, and even care for our bodies. And so living intentionally means changing, which means repenting. And as he said, repenting is not a bad word. It's a, the key to our progress. Let's just talk uh, for a minute about how we could apply that practical knowledge to, or to one of those areas President Nelson discussed, to the care of our bodies. We could use our morning scripture study to study the word of wisdom, to study what prophets have said about it. We have a lot of questions from people in the church. Is vaping okay? Is using medical marijuana okay? Are energy drinks okay? We're never going to be able to put out a list of all the kosher foods for the Latter-day Saints. But if you can, for yourself, as you study the Word of Wisdom, stop and think about your life and write down the things the Spirit tells you to do. Some of those things might be 
eat three balanced meals. Stop eating junk food. Get more exercise. Study dietary changes that would address a specific health risk or problem that you have. Or figure out a way to feed your mind on more uplifting materials. And as you write those down, then say, what will I do today? And make your life conform to the things that you felt as you pondered that question and studied it. President Nelson spoke to the New Temple President, 63 New Temple Presidents this morning. He's 95 years old, and he jumped up. He's, he is a living witness of someone who's lived intentionally with regard to the care of his body. Now, that's just an example. You think of the principle that's important for you and take that and each day study something and incorporate it so that you can live that day intentionally. Another part of living intentionally is the sacrament. Each week when you go, you can sit and take of the sacrament and ponder how you've done to live intentionally, how you've done to actually incorporate the gospel in. Living intentionally keeps us focused on those things that matter most, on the questions that are most important for you. There are many questions on the internet. People post all kinds of questions. Don't depend on those questions. You figure out the questions that are important to you. Put the questions that others have aside and let them focus on those. You focus on what's there for you. When we blindly make, take questions off the internet and social media, we cede our agency. We think as someone else wants us to think. That's not living intentionally. On the other hand, when we study the scriptures, pray daily, and generate our own inspired questions that drive our daily progress and growth, then we are living intentionally. I witness that we are able to live intentionally because of God's plan and God's laws. I witness that Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost make it possible to be led in our learning and in our actions to help us progress and find joy in this mortal life. Jesus said, I am come that they, or that we, might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. My prayer and hope for all of us is that we can live our lives intentionally centered on Jesus Christ and his gospel. That is the life I want for me and my family, and it is the life that I want for you. I witness that we have loving, heavenly parents who have a plan, specific plan for each of our lives, and that Jesus Christ is the Savior and Redeemer of the world. The Holy Ghost is our holy and sacred friend and partner to help us grow in progress. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's kingdom on the earth today. And Russell M. Nelson is his prophet. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.